The Business of Cleaning, the podcast that brings cleaning industry expertise straight to your ears. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Business of Cleaning. My name is Haley Morris, and welcome back to our show. This is our first episode of our once a month release, and I am excited to announce that I brought on Jason Morris. He is the director of HR at Owens Community College up here in the Toledo area of Ohio. And we are going to be broaching the very broad, very obscure topic of retention today, because I know it's something that we struggle a lot with in the industry, and we're here to shed some light. So Jason, if you don't mind, can you introduce yourself? Sure, Ava. Haley, thank you for having me. Uh, Retention is a great topic that a lot of people are heavily discussing right now with the uh, lack of employees out there and many, many openings. So as Haley mentioned, my name is Jason Morse. I'm the Executive Director of HR for Owens Community College. I've been in the human resource field for close to 20 years. Um, Most recently, I was at a Hollywood casino here in Toledo um, where we, we did have close to a 50% turnover rate. So retention was a very uh, at the tip of the mind concept and something we were talking about very heavily. Uh, and prior to that, I spent some time in HR in the architectural engineering world, as well as the finance world as well, too. Thank you. I'm excited to have you on. It, like I said, it's a very important topic in the industry right now, especially with all of the large and sweeping changes. I know every time the CDC announces something, it affects the industry, which means it affects the jobs and how people are cleaning or what products they're using or this or that. And with the virus and safety being a big concern and the things that had happened last year and how things are shifting this year, there's a lot of things happening. And like you said, the applicant poll is feeling pretty dry. Um, But retention is an ongoing topic, and I know this is one that's been important for a while and will continue to be important for a while because it's something that, like you said, you worked at Hollywood Casino for a while, and it was still just as important when you left as when you started. It doesn't stop being a conversation starter. Right. And I think that's important, too. Retention is not an easy fix, and it's not something that you roll out a fix for and expect to be done. Retention and the the concept of retaining talent has to be an ongoing, consistent and constant uh, mechanism. And, you know, it is gonna be ever changing. And as you just mentioned, COVID-19 brought different challenges. You have to remember for the last year and a half, folks have been working from home predominantly, right? So now as we start to go back into the office place, we have a whole new retention issue that we've never had before, which is, do I want to go back into an office and work? Do I want to go back into the environment and work around people? There's also the concept right now that maybe folks don't want to work. You know, there's, there's a lot of government assistance type of things out there right now with stimulus and increased unemployment rates that make things a little bit easier for people to say, I don't know if I want to go back into that. So retention cannot be a stagnant plan. You have to continue looking at it and what is the social factors affecting it every day. Yeah, I know that's been a question because we're starting to bring people back into the office and I'm hearing a lot of people do. So your administrators of your business, like uh, your executives and you yourself, if you have a physical office environment, you might be questioning, are we going back in? How many people do we have in this office environment? You might be talking about um, your in-person trainings and things like that for your staff. How hands-on are you? How hands-on have you been able to be with social distancing and everything else in play? We're cleaning buildings and other environments. So generally it is one of the cleaner jobs at the end of the day. Um, But there is still the concern of, there's a lot of questions on how this virus spread. Who's vaccinated, who's not? Is it safe? Um, Who's getting tested? So coming back and things like that are... So scary. And like you said, some people don't want to don't want to work while they're comfortable right now financially. Right. And think about this, too, with COVID-19. And as you just mentioned, going in and cleaning buildings, I mean, they're, they're at risk, right? There, there's there's anybody walking into it, any kind of buildings at risk for any potential. There's still a lot we don't know about this this virus. 
The thing with retention though is, can you retain talent and can you get them to feel comfortable in that decision to come back and be a part of that, your organization? Um, you know, because that's really the job of leaders is to say, hey, I'm going to do the best I can to provide you the, the safest and cleanest environment I can for you to work in and do your job. Um, and I think that's where it starts with that communication. And that's what helps retention. If folks know that you're being black and white with stuff, this is what's going on. This is our protocols. Here's what we're doing. Here's how we're going to help protect you. Here's how we're going to keep you safe. That starts. You know, but I've heard of companies that have went very quiet during COVID-19. You know, we're not, here's not what we're doing or not giving updates. Well, you know, those folks feel a little like left out. What's my exposure? What's my risk here? Certainly, if another opportunity or job comes up, they're going to want to jump on that different risk. So number one, really for retention, especially in this environment today, is being very transparent about what's going on, what we're doing to keep you safe, and making that first and person feel comfortable coming back into that environment too. Mm -hmm. Well, the other thing I think I've noticed just across the board with businesses is that communication and transparency with customers is sometimes better or stronger than it is with your own employees because customers sort of demand it and they're the paycheck. They're the ones who are, are making sure you get paid, but they're first time an employee hears about a change or something that's happening within the customer company, it shouldn't be when you're telling your customers, or at least I wouldn't think it should be like, they should know first, they should feel comfortable. And then it moves outside the company, whatever decision you're making. Right. Yeah. And and top down communication has always, it's always a struggle, right? What, what do we share? What don't we share? But, you know, a long time ago, I had a, a, a mentor who said the phrase, happy employees equal happy clients, right? And what she meant by that is if we keep our, our talent happy, engaged, and communicated with, they're going to turn around and spread that out to their customers and their clients and the people they interact with. And as you just mentioned, if, you, if you're not aware of a change or a process or a policy change or change in the way we do things, and you're finding that out at the last minute, you might have your own opinion. You may feel differently about that and you may not be able to sell that idea or be so happy about it. So hundred percent, it really involves that top down communication, making sure people are aware, um, especially now with what we're dealing with, with this COVID-19 world is people need to be aware and feel safe and, and feel comfortable. Yeah. The other thing um, with that communication, like you said, the, the radio silence from certain people is that it's that in it feels like more and more companies, at least their public facing communication has gotten quieter this year. Now that people are like sort of fed up with the virus more and like ready to transition back. Some companies are just kind of, Oh, I feel like their policies sound like they're less strict or they're not communicated or they don't have one. Um, And I know that, you know, as we're bringing people back, it's like you said, it is so much more important because we are still dealing with this, especially as like, the business owners and the leaders within these companies are still dealing with this, even if maybe the employees are fed up of hearing about COVID or things like that. Like they still want to know they're safe. Right. I think any company who's not used the last year and a half to relook at the way they do things, it's a big mistake. You really should look at your policies, your procedures, the way you communicate, the way you're set up. This is this has been a great opportunity, it, you know. And now we say there's some good and the bad sometimes to really look at how we do things. Um, you know, the former employer I was with, we every Wednesday had an, a town hall meeting, and we took questions from employees. That's kind of a uh, that's a risky move at times, right? I mean, you open and let people call in and ask questions, but you know, we allowed our folks to ask the questions that were on their mind, and so you have to change a little bit. You have to look at how how things function and how you want to be. And, you know, people are going to remember how the company comes out of these kind of, these, these moments. They're going to remember, you know, did you take care of them? Did you communicate with them? Did you keep them safe? Did you do your best to be a good employer? Or they're going to remember the employers who, you know, didn't communicate. They went radio silent. The people are going to remember that. And that's right there. That's a key to retention as well. So we kind of mentioned before that, um, there's more to retention than just the obvious. So what are some of the other things besides the transparency and communication that 
you know, are really being highlighted with everything that's happened this last year? Well, I mean, let's, let's step back to the core of retention, right? So retention is the concept of how to retain talent, keep your talent pool live and, and flourishing and, you know, developing leaders and developing great talent. So retention to me starts even before the employee walks in the door. And to me, when you really look at retention is looking at your company culture and saying, what are we, who do we want to be? Because that is what our future employees are going to see. You know, if they see a company that's connected in the community or developing great processes or products, or, you know, their word of mouth says, man, I'd love to work at this place. I mean, you know, sometimes you hear people joke and let's use Amazon, for example, right? So people are like, man, I heard Amazon's coming to town and they do this and they do that. I'd love to work there. That's, that's all word of mouth. I mean, you don't see a lot of Amazon commercials on TV saying come work here. It's, you know, it's people talking about it. And so it's really developing a culture. And you as a leader need to understand what your culture is. And if you don't, that's the step one is understanding who we are and what we want to be. And then from there, you know, the folks that will work within that culture, you know, so if you are a innovative and you know, high tech innovative culture, or if you are a hardworking culture, then you know the kind of folks you're looking for. And that's how you develop your job descriptions. That's how you develop your interview process. You know, one of the examples that I'll use is when we used to hire dishwashers, right? That's a, in an in a industry, you would wash dishes for eight hours a day. That's not something a lot of people can do, right? However, you look for the personal fit in that culture, who's willing to roll their seats up, work hard. But part of our interview process was bringing that person into the kitchen and showing them the environment. This is where you'll spend your seven or eight hours a day. You'll be in here dishwashing. And they saw people having a good time and laughing and joking. They saw the managers, you know, their sleeves rolled up helping when things got busy. And they saw what the environment was. You compare that to an interview where you pull the person into a closed office and say, hey, you're going to be a dishwasher. And they go, okay, I'll do this. And they walk out. And then, you know, three weeks later, they're at the job. Like, this is not what I thought it was, right? So you lose that person. So first, you know, like I just mentioned, you got to get your culture set up. You got to know what will fit, what works in your environment. Ask the right questions. Do the appropriate interview. Have the appropriate people part of the interview process, right? you know, tell the stories and, and get people excited about wanting to come work for you. You know, the, be excited about what you have to offer. If you make a product, this is what we do. And this is, this is how we are. This is what we're excited about. So once you get them in the door, then we have this common mistake, right? Which is, okay, we hired this person and now they're good. They're here. They're good forever, right? Well, no, because the moment they walk in the door, they do that natural thing. And let me ask you, Haley, when you first started your job, right, and you sat down at the desk that one day, you probably asked yourself this question, what did I get myself into, right? <laughs> yeah. Do I know this place? Did I make the right choice? Did I pick somewhere else? It's natural. Everybody does it. I do it every time I take a new position. And that's okay. And that's normal. But you want to make sure that you've made the experience so positive for that person that they go, yes, I have. And that involves checking in on them. That involves making sure that that person's manager is there that first day. You know, if you do something like give them a free t-shirt, you have the t-shirt there available for the first day. If their name tagged ready or they're set up in the system. Nothing is worse for someone when you start your job the first day. You're not in the system. You don't have an ID. Nobody's there to tell you what you're to do. I guarantee you that if that's the, that's the um, first interaction that person has, they're already thinking, did I pick the right place? Did I take the right job? And it doesn't matter if you're an executive to, you know, you're a cleaning crew member. You need to feel like you made the right choice. And so once you get through that first day, then it's important that you're checking in. And those check-ins are so crucial, right? You're, you're talking to the person. How are things going? What's working? But you as the leader should be asking a couple important questions. Number one, did I tell you or did I describe the job right? Because if the person says, yeah, this is exactly what you told me, then you know you're doing the right thing. But if that person goes, no, you didn't tell me I was on my feet for eight hours a day doing this. Okay, we got to change that process up, right? We got to make sure we're asking the right questions. You know, are you, you know, do you have the tools and resources to do your job? If you expect someone to be cleaning all day long and all day they're getting new product, changing this, and having to get this out, 
Okay, well, what, what would you recommend? So get them involved, get them engaged in that process. You know, and then you follow up and say, what can I do for you? What do you need? What are you missing? That interaction needs to continue and it needs to be important that that's part of that person's career with you. You know, you don't want to wait till the exit interview. And a lot of people think retention means, hey, you know, John Smith is leaving the company. Let's find out why John's leaving. Well, if you had a really good retention plan, you wouldn't have to wait till when John was leaving. You would have been connecting with him through the process. And you may have stopped him from leaving too. You know, I think back in uh, December or November or something, we were talking about this same topic. We had done previous content for the show and I actually came to you. We were one of the first people I did. And I, I was asking your opinion and you said something about the exit interview back then. And I think you said something along the lines of if the first time, you know, they're leaving is when like they walk out the door, then you've done something wrong. Yeah. I think it was something yeah. along that line. Yeah. Shame, shame on you at that point. If, if the first time that you truly have learned that, you know, your employee is unhappy and they're leaving is through that exit interview then you don't have enough of those self checkpoints, you know, you, you, and, and it doesn't have to be elaborate meetings. It could be comfortable supervisors walking up to their new employees or the employees who've been there for a while and say, how are things going? But have three or four of those questions that you're always checking in on, you know, how are things going? Do you have what you need to be successful? Do you have any ideas or suggestions for improvement? What can I offer you? You know, those three or four things constantly ask those things, because then, you know, if that person says, well, you know, I'm getting a little tired of working this or I'm getting tired of doing this or, you know, let's use an example. Every day I have to go do this and fill this this product up and it takes extra time for me to go do it. Right. Well, you might say, hey, did you know that you could do this? And that You just solved that person's problem. But that little issue then could fester into so much more if it's like, well, you know, this company doesn't care about me. I have to do this. Nobody's listening to me. Nobody's hearing me. Nobody wants to hear my, you know, my thoughts or suggestions. So you, you eliminate all those points and then you, you help to retention right then. But again, like you just said, if the first time you're hearing about it is during the exit interview, that's right. It's, it's a lost cause. I mean, exit interviews typically produce the same results. I'm leaving because I want more money. I'm leaving because someone offered me a different job. I'm leaving because the truth is money, yes, while important, different hours while important, you leave because you're not connected or not, the culture is not there. You're not, you don't feel a part of that organization. We all have worked jobs. We've all done things that we don't really want to do at times, right? But we do it because there's a greater reason for it. We feel connected. We want to be a part of that team. And speaking of like that culture that you know, really is employee centered and so important for that connection. Earlier, you mentioned something about the dishwasher job, right? You said that not everyone could do that job. And I think that's important in, you know, in the cleaning industry too, is to realize not everybody can do those cleaning jobs, right? There's this misconception that because it's easy to train the skill to do it because, it's, or it's easier to say, this is how you wipe something down, or this is how you clean this floor, that because somebody can learn to do that, that they can actually do the job for eight hours or so a day, and that they can fit into that role. Mm -hmm. Is almost, sometimes there's almost this belittlement, and the public does this a lot with the cleaning industry. There's been a highlight and higher expressions of important for those types of jobs, but we still see it where employers say, we can put anybody in this job. If we can train them, they can do it, right? But that's not true, is it? Right. No, and I think one of the best programs I was ever involved in was a, a program called Walk a Mile, right? And so you would take some of your, your senior leadership members or your executive team members, and they would spend a couple of days working the shift or doing the job of what people consider, as you just described, oh, it's an easy job. It's a dishwasher or it's a house cleaning position, right? And you learned that eight or nine hours doing that is not as easy as you may think. And, and it gives you appreciation. Now, there's a flip side is you're only doing it for a couple of days. But, you know, part of it is understanding that, you know, those jobs are tough. They're, they're not easy jobs. And so you've got to get the person 
to feel a part of your organization and feel appreciated and then feel engaged because like you said, I mean, those jobs are not easy and it's very easy to go find something else. Um, and especially in this job market right now with, you know, the unemployment number so low and so many jobs. I mean, you can't drive around right now without someone offering you a job, right? And I've seen signs now saying, we'll pay your college or we'll give you this or, you know, these kind of discounts. There's always something better out there. And so you got to take the core jobs that are sometimes the toughest and make those folks feel appreciated and recognized. And sometimes it means pulling up your own sleeves and getting in there and spending a day with them and saying, man, this is this is some hard work. Maybe we should try to do this, or maybe we should spend a little bit of money here. Or, you know, you have some great ideas, but connect with people. If you're gonna sit there and spend eight hours and just not do anything and interact, it's not gonna benefit. But if you spend the eight hours really seeing the, you know, seeing it through someone else's eyes and hearing the feedback and hearing the suggestions, it, that'll have a change. Mm-hmm. Well, one of the things that we do at our company is we offer a software solution. There are suppliers for chemicals or equipment or things like that. And business makers are making these decisions on what they want. But if they're to do something like that, to go actually work with the employee every so often for a day or so and understanding that job, they could make a decision to say, we need this type of equipment, right? Because it's, you know, it's like you said, you can make their job a bit easier and take the burden off a certain aspect that doesn't need to be there. So think of this, right? One of my departments, uh, um, we had a, a dishwasher that wasn't working. Nobody knew, right? So we had this very expensive piece of equipment that wasn't working because, you know, the employees didn't have the opportunity to provide that update and they didn't have a chance to give that feedback. So we just didn't we didn't run that piece of equipment. It took a manager doing a walk mile one day to ask the question, why, why aren't we using that dishwasher over there? And someone said, oh, that hasn't worked for five years. So a brand new piece of equipment that costs a lot of money, hasn't been working for many, many years, simple fix, got to replace and put in there. But you see the conversation that, and you have to get there, you know, and that's the connection. And, and really when you talk about retention, it's also making sure that your leadership is connected with the employees. They should feel comfortable enough to come to you and say, that dishwasher is not working. We need to get this fixed or that chemical is not working or the chemical that you keep ordering or the project you keep ordering is not working. Um, because, you know, I, I, one of my, one of my former supervisors, he always said, it's great when all we sit in our office is to make these great decisions. Right. But it's a little bit different when we're actually out there doing it. We have great ideas in these offices and all these things sound good on paper, but with actually doing it and being a part of an experience in that's the difference. Exactly. And it's one of those things like I've heard people mention that like employees just won't help. They say, oh, well, the employees don't tell me about this. They didn't tell me that dishwasher is broken. They didn't tell me that they were actually spending two hours cleaning these floors when a machine would do it a lot quicker. And then they could get to those rooms they missed. Right. There's this. Well, they didn't tell me. And you're you're talking about actually going to the employees, making yourself open and not just expecting them to put in the work to come to you first. Right. And, you know, think about this right now. What what is the difference between any other job that's hiring right now, any other cleaning job or any other similar type role? Right. What the difference is, is how that person feels and the engagement they have. Does the person that they work for generally care and concern about their thoughts, opinions, or suggestions? Or are you just another employee to them who's serving a purpose? And that's the difference. That's that's the key to retention right there. And that's the cultural change that, you know, my senior leadership, my leadership team cares about my thoughts. They they make sure I have the tools and resources I need. they want to know my opinions on things and, and I'm comfortable enough in an environment where I can go and tell them those kind of things in a obviously respectful way. But, you know, we have that dialogue. You start taking those parts out. What's the difference between you and any other company down the street? It is one of those things too. You have to prioritize making that environment. You know, you can't say as a boss, okay, I want to be, I want to be able to communicate with my employees and then to tell me what's wrong. And then maybe just like occasionally asking for like, you know, what doesn't work or what's your problem areas and never doing anything else. Like it's, it's more than just a thought and like one small change. 
it's a continuous effort. And we mentioned like managers and supervisors and these people that are working directly with your team members every, or, you know, quite frequently, it depends on the type of job, but they're part of that same chain of command, right? They're part of that same line of communication, open or otherwise. Well, and, and what you described is a common mistake a lot of places do. So they have an employee survey, right? So let's just say company A, they say, hey, you know what? We have these employees, we're gonna do a survey. And they do a survey once a year. They ask their employees how they feel about things. They take the results, a group of people sit around a room, look at the results and say, hey, we got our feedback, here's what we should do. Maybe we shouldn't do this and they're done with it, right? And then they wait till the following year and they ask the same questions all over again. And the employees go, wow. Oh, it really doesn't matter, I guess, because if I said we should stop doing this and a year later, we're still doing that. So I think you have to remember that it's employee stories are great, but it's also the other things and, and engagement and retention isn't just something that you can plug in once a year or on a routine basis. It's, it's a process. It's an interactive thing. So one of the best things with engagement surveys or employee surveys is ask questions but then do something with the results. Tell people, here's what you ranked us on a survey. Here's some action items, and here's what we're gonna do to fix this. So if an employee says, you know, it's really tough to do this job task. All right, we have, a, we formed a committee, we found a better way to do it, and here's how we're gonna do it. That's a simple way for those employees to know that they heard your feedback. You know, the, the other part of it is, is a simple thank you sometimes. You know, some people take away the value of walking up to someone and saying thank you and they think, well, <clears throat> excuse me, um, they think, you know, I, I have to do pizza parties and I have to give them shirts and I have to give them bonuses and all that stuff. Well, yeah, I mean, that stuff's helpful, right? We all like those kind of things. But the value of walking up to someone and saying thank you is just a miss, miss point so much anymore. I think I said something like it was a teacher actually, which a lot of times, you know, when you're working with a group, like you've got one supervisors and they got multiple people that report to them. It's very easy to point out what they are not doing or what they're missing on or complain that they're just not listening. Right. But then the other thing that she mentioned is that she had a one-on-one, -on -one, you know, like we said those touch bases, like actually sitting down with employees and seeing where they're at. She did that with her students and if they were just rocking it or had some really good stuff they were doing, even if not everything was going right, she made sure that she recognized that. And I said, oh my gosh, wouldn't that make a difference if like employees in their office places just on a regular basis had their supervisor acknowledge what they're doing well? Yeah. Think of the, 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 how you feel when you're recognized. And, you know, one of the things too of being recognized is I would recommend allowing it not only the supervisor or your senior leadership to be able to do it, but employees to employees be able to recognize each other. That's just as important to be able to feel connected to the culture and being able to say, hey, hands up or high five or whatever, you did a great job on this. You know, those are those are powerful moments. You know, I, I think back in through my career, you know, I walked in with a proposal and I walked into um, our general manager's office and we went through it and he said I love the idea and we walked out and my and my supervisor at the time we walked out and she gave me a high five that's all she did and it was so powerful because it was like you know I had her support and I knew that she was proud of me for doing what you know what we just did and what we just accomplished you know and it, it was a it was a high five walking down the hallway but it, it just it was powerful you know because you felt like hey I was this person cared enough about me to do that you know, we're, we're so caught up in trying to meet quotas, meet numbers and, you know, COVID and everything else sometimes. I think we forget sometimes the value of that, the importance of each other and being a team and being a part of that team. And that's, that's sadly one of the things that I think has really been hurt by COVID-19 is we've all kind of left and we've went into our own offices or we went from work from home and we've forgotten about being a part of that team or that collaboration. It doesn't matter what job you are. I mean, you can be, you know, cleaning or dishwashing or whatever. But if you feel part of something, you feel part of the team, I think that that changes the way you look at your position or your job. We started to do team meetings recently. Um, not that we wouldn't talk before, but it was always kind of broken up in different project meetings and different things like that. So we started to do 
just our team meetings. And like the first part of the call is literally just catching up fun stuff like boss's new cat or this or that. And then we get in and we start talking. There's always jokes and movie references and things as we go. Um, but we get it done. And I can't tell you like how much of an impact that has on my week, especially right there in the middle where <laughs> you're trying to get through the week. So I know the little thing that's, that's where like the recognition for what projects we're working on, how much we're getting done comes up. And it, it is one of those things when you're part of that group and you feel like you're working towards things together. And, you know, sometimes we, we have this stuff going on too. We can help each other and we don't realize it. And you get a little like rewarding feeling that you can offer like advice or you can offer a tip to make an employee's, another employee's, a team member's life easier. It also feels good. That's mm -hmm. the kind of stuff that you want to be doing. And like you said, it, it was kind of forgotten when everybody just went remote and forgot that um, video chat was used more than just the necessary meetings and like um, to just contact clients and things like that, that you, you lost each other a little bit in the shuffle. Yeah, so I, I'm gonna go back real far in history and I, I'm gonna go back to third grade for me, right? And I had a third grade teacher who, I'll tell you, she understood the concept of rewards recognition way better than a lot of HR professionals, right? So she did this thing that every morning, the first person who had all their stuff put away were at their desk, who had their pencil ready, had their book ready, open to the appropriate chapter. The people that were done first, she'd walk up and she'd hand them this little blue, little paper, right? And a little blue paper, if you had enough of them, got you a little piece of candy or something like that. I mean, insignificant, right? But you should have saw the effect, and I remember this so distinctively in third grade, sitting there ready to go in my spot, organized, books ready, backpack put away, hoping I was going to get that little blue piece of paper, a little blue piece of paper, right? And how it felt when she would walk up to you and hand you that little blue piece of paper. And I mean, you just bursted. And I think, you know, that, that concept bring it towards today, just something as small as a little thank you, or you're the rock star this week, or the MVP this week, or, hey, Haley, great job on that project you were working on. How important that little thing is. I mean, you know, many, many years later now, I still think, I mean, that's how powerful that was. Just, I, and I distinctively remember that little blue piece of paper, but being recognized for whatever. And it was simply, let's think about it. All she wanted to do was not have to tell us to be quiet and be, get ready. It was get in your seat and be ready to go. And we did it. We complied. We got done and we were all eager and we fought to see who could be the first one there. But it was so important to be recognized. And, and if you're not recognizing or recognizing your talent, that, that's, that's one of the biggest effects on your retention too. It was kind of fun because it made it a little bit of a competition. It got you guys like not necessarily interacting, but kind of trying to to be better than the other one in, in something friendly, not like intense either. Um, I had a teacher in high school bring back the sticker charts for when you got certain grades. So you get a sticker on your test when it was above a 90 and then you get to put one on the sticker chart for everybody to see. And uh, I can't tell you how many people had stickers all the way across the row and probably did better in French class than any other class because of a sticker chart and how pleased you were. You know, and we were high schoolers. You think like, oh, high schoolers think they're too old for that. And like adults don't get into that. And I would have loved it. Actually, I had somebody do it in college too. Just as effective then. But like, it's the same thing with employees. It seems like such a small thing. And you think, oh, like they don't need that to do their job. But simple, like little things of recognition, like the, you said, the thank yous or just like highlights, um, like who's really just knocking it out of the park this week with their job. Yeah. That could make somebody feel so recognized. And then like, there's a little bit of camaraderie of who's doing well this week. Can I get to that point? You know, can I get recognized for, for cleaning super well or for getting, you know, more than expected done or things like that. You feel good. Well, and but think of being recognized even a little bit of a step further, right? Are your company policies recognizing the employees are they centered around the folks there right so if you have a scenario where you have a little one at home and they're sick is your company allow you to be able to you know to call off an appropriate way and do that or 
is your company set that, you know what, we, we don't care about your family life. We don't care about what's outside of here. And so being recognized isn't just sometimes also just the little, the little blue piece of paper, but it's also the way you set up your culture and the policies and the reward mechanisms and the way you treat people. Um, you know, do we reward people with bonuses or increases? Do we reward people for doing a job well done? Do we give people the appropriate time off so they can re relax and recharge? Um, you know, so it's also the way we operate is how we recognize people too. And if we recognize people or if we operate the same way we've operated for the last 20 years, so let's say a company has been around for 20 years, and if we do everything the way we've done it for the last 20 years and not made any changes, that could be a problem too. You know, we things have changed, technology changes, the way people interact. This, this last year has changed the way we think. You know, some of the organizations I'm closely involved with right now are saying, how do we work from home some days a week? You know, we've allowed it to happen. So we have to be fluid with the way we operate too. Mm -hmm. Well, and you know, things have changed. Your team members are often completely different people in 20 years than what they were when you started your business. Um, especially for, you know, a smaller business that has seen good growth. Like some businesses did very well during the pandemic and continue to grow or see growth that they didn't expect. So with that growth and with like, the changing environment of your team is bigger, it has different people, your culture is going to shift on its own. Like the tone and needs of your people is going to shift. So are you acknowledging that and moving with it versus just trying to make it what you want it to be? Right. And do you have the leaders and supervisors who are embracing that and encouraging that culture? And when you go to hire folks, are you looking for people that will fit in that cultural fit? You know, and do they have the knowledge? Do they have the skills? Do they have the abilities? But do they also, are they going to be successful in the organization? Nobody wants to bring someone into your organization that's not going to be successful, right? You know, if you're just hiring to fill a spot, then then you're, that's why your turnover rates. I mean, I've been in part of organizations, I've seen turnover rates as high as 50%. You know, we've hired 400 people and we've termed 400 people every year. And, and you know, that, that affects your culture. But you really, like you just said, you have to embrace the culture and understand it shifts and changes and major life events, major changes in products or advancements are going to change that culture. Major ways of technology is going to change it. Yeah, it's like you said, high turnover itself impacts culture in a negative way. If people are constantly coming and going, it does create a sense of being just a number to the company of not being important because, oh, well, Am I going to be one of the people that leave? They don't think about those people choosing to leave or if they weren't suited for the job, they think about those people that were, that were let go or they think about their job being at risk. And then, you know, they don't have time sometimes to build relationships if their team is always changing. And think about where you work at is most of the time, the second most of your time being spent at, right? Your family is number one, typically spend most time there. But outside of that, your work family, as you may call it, is where you're spending second most of your time. And so, yeah, when people are coming in and out of the door, it's, it's, it's not healthy. It's, it's, you know, it, it makes you question things. It makes you wonder. You, know, you typically don't know why the last <clears throat> employee just left. It may, it may be because they're moving or whatever, but it's just to you, another person leaving the organization, another new face, someone else we're going to have to train, someone else we're going to have to, a personality we're going to have to deal with, right? And and that affects, and, and for some of your long-term employees, after a while, that gets tiresome. How many times do I have to keep retraining? How many times do I have to show the new kid how to do something, right? Or the new person how to do something. So you, you got to really take in mind that that turnover number does affect and and the lower that turnover, it's going to be helpful. But when you get that high turnover, it's just a constant change. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those things like employee mental health is a rising like concern, I think across, well, mental health in general, I, it's trending topic on social media and everywhere, but talking about like the high turnover or the interaction when it's so much of your life and you're doing it it can have a huge impact on your mood and your mindset and things like that. And how that employee is able to work and embrace their day can be determined just by the team that they're on and how many people are moving through that team. Or is it a steady team that they feel like they can rely on? Do they feel appreciated? 
you know, when they start to feel these things, all these things make a, if you do them right, make a happy employee and a happy person is going to get the job done. They're going to support the company at the end of the day, but if they're not happy, it kind of starts to fall apart. You know, if they're not happy, their team members feel it and it just kind of multiplies. Yeah, I think it's important to re- recognize that, you know, in the last couple of years, there's a lot of things going on that's outside the workplace that we don't always know about. We don't know if someone's facing an eviction or a foreclosure or if they're struggling to make ends meet. Um, and, and, you know, and I understand a lot of employers will say, well, that's not my problem. That's not my fault. I don't care if, you know, my employee, you know, it's, that's their own issue. They can't balance their money. We don't, we don't know the circumstances. We don't know the things that happen for that. And so it's 100% accurate for you to say that if someone is feeling that pressure at home, it's going to come into the workplace and they're feeling stressed. And so it's important to offer, you know, your employees, do you have EAP, you know, EAPs, employer assistance programs? Do you have numbers for folks to call? Do you have resources for them? Because people go through a lot of stuff and, you know, and that's another, that's another key to retention. Were you there for them when they had tough times? Did you give them solutions? And, you know, you, you may not be able to, give them a lot, but it might be a phone call or it might be, Hey, you know, I, I see some stuff going on right now. Here's our employer assistance program. And a lot of those, those providers, I mean, are very insignificant in cost. You can get connected with different providers for those, but they're trained professionals that pick up the phone and answer your employees' concerns and give them counseling or whatever items they have, you know, take a look at your benefits right now. Do you have those wellness type things in there? Do you have, you know, is it wellness initiatives? Do you have, you know, are you encouraging folks to get physicals every year or encouraging folks to make healthy uh, choices each time? Um, those are the things that are most utmost importance right now because there is, there's a lot of stress right now. And I, I don't know if I see it going away for a while because, you know, unfortunately COVID-19 will result in something else will become stressful for people. Um, but you, you need to be compassionate to those, those folks and understand there's a lot a lot of things going on in some folks' minds sometimes. Mm-hmm. Well, and a lot of people have dealt with like seasonal depression, depression from the lack of interaction. As your employees are coming back to the office or coming back to interacting more, they're a lot of times coming back from just being at home all the time and not interacting with people. And they're going to be different than when they, you know, left. You know, they're it's like you said, you have all of these things that you can't always see as an employer, but you should be supporting them so that if they have stuff like this, they can get through it so that they can actually be present at their job. Like they're not concerned about if they're getting dinner on the table when they get home, you know, things like that, if wherever possible. And then, you know, you mentioned before the days off and sick days and vacations and things like that it's such a big thing because people are so worried to take days off. Like a lot of, a lot of companies I've noticed that vacation and sick are wrapped together in PTO. Now I'm seeing that Mm -hmm. more. Um, So I know like one concern is like, if I'm sick, that's also my vacation day, you know, employees don't want to take off because they're sick, which is kind of alarming right now when we're trying to be, you know, clean and healthy in environments that employer employees might come in anyways so that they don't have to use those days. If they don't have enough, that's a high risk. Right. I think if COVID nineteen taught us anything was if you're if you're sick, you need to stay home, right? You need to take care of yourself. So, you know, that's a policy a lot of um, companies have really said is you know before we didn't really get into that area, but now we're telling you if you're if you're sick, stay home, take care of yourself, get better. And and it's important. And I know there's staffing shortages, and we we have to be able to operate. But, you know, we also need to make sure our folks are healthy, too. We got to take care of our own team, um, and, you know, and, and relook at your things. And, and you just mentioned something that's really important. A lot of folks have been sitting at home for the last year and a half working at their desk by themselves in their basement or whatever office they've set up. Right. And now they're ready to come back into the real. They, so they went from wearing their little snuggy PJs and, you know, doing Zoom meetings to now I'm back in the office or I'm back in work or I'm around 20, 30 people again it's going to be stressed. The thought of, for some people going back into that environment has to be super stressful for a lot of people. And so you got to make sure you have the tools and resources that are available for them, but allow them to be able to go in back into it in a comfortable way. You know, I think a lot of companies who are able to offer hybrid schedules 
or, or some benefit to that. Now, not everybody can. I mean, there, there are areas where you need the people back and I completely support that. But if there is some opportunity to be a little bit flexible, I think this, this uh, situation the last year and a half has taught us that we need to look at things the way we operate a little bit different. We need to treat people a little bit different. We need to be better partners with our, with our folks, our, our team members, our customers, our clients, all of that. We have to partner better. Yeah. And even if you're like, if you're a cleaning position where these people have been working all along and they have to be in person because you have to be on a location to clean a location. But one of the things is you might have cut people back to part time and they might have been able to do that with some of the assistants and other things. Or, you know, they might have been might have been completely laid off for this time and they're just now coming back is. I know I got used to at home being able to if I'm getting antsy because I'm very like all over the place, I could be very ADHD and I need to move sometimes and change my scenery that I could do that at home. I could go work in a different room for an hour and get a breather from my space and come back where I could get up and take the dog out or do something and come back. And it refreshes and recharges versus if they're on the job, you know, to come back to the way things were before where the opportunity to sometimes just get up and stretch your legs or take a breather and, you know, kind of refresh your mind, they're limited. That's hard for somebody to to do, especially all at once if they're coming back to a full-time in-person environment. Yeah, agreed. Um, you know, I think you have to look at the way you operate and, um, you know, step back a little bit and say, you know, what are our expectations? Have we been able to change some of those? Are we a little bit more flexible with the way we do things? And I've heard of some of my colleagues in different industries say, you know, we realized that we could get the same job done in six hours. We don't need that person sitting there doing it for eight hours and wasting two hours every day. And, you know, that other person appreciates not having to waste some of their time there. So, you know, part-time schedules are great right now if you had the flexibility to do some of those things. If it's switching from part-time to full-time, you know, having these conversations, what's different, what's changed a little bit. So I think you you really need to look at your operating procedures right now and see how you can maximize your potential there too. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. So as we're kind of coming to the end of our conversation here, what are some of the biggest things that somebody listening to this episode should take home with them or take back, I guess, back to the office with them as they're really looking to implement change and actually make a difference in their retention. Right. Well, I think it, it starts with, you know, starting the concept of retention before the person walks in the door and making sure you as the leader or the operator, or the business owner, know your culture, understand your culture, understand the way things work. Look at your communication methods. Look at the way you reward and recognize people, you know, and, and make the changes there. And then as you bring new talent in, you make sure that they fit within that in that environment and they're going to be successful, you know, and then you have your follow-ups and you have your, if you choose to do a surveys or if you choose to do your check-ins or one-on-one -on -one meetings that you have those, you have them regularly. And then you follow up with those and you know, put some meaning or put some power behind those, those, those moments. And then it's those check-ins is do you have the tools and resources? Do you have feedback? Do you have suggestions? believing the open door, open communication policies open there. And then, you know, the biggest thing of change is being recognized that, you know, we've done something one way, we might need to change it. So keeping your procedures or your policies or your, the way you do things is kind of fluid right now and, and being open to maybe looking at things a little bit differently. You know, like we said, we started off with saying the first time, you know, someone's leaving is the exit interview. If you walk away today and say, well, we're still going to do our next interview, that's great. Probably should still do an next interview, but there should be a lot more steps to get you there. And hopefully, if you do it right, you won't need those next interviews. A lot more steps before you even bring them in the door. Correct. Oh. All right. Well, I think that is a fantastic place to wrap it up. This is a huge, like I said, a huge talking point for this industry. And you really need to like think through if you have to listen to the episode multiple times, that's fine. But it, Jason's brought a lot of great things up and a lot of great points. And so no matter what position your employees and whether they're 
you know, doing your marketing or they're, they're your supervisors or they're out there actually cleaning, remember that they're important. Not everybody can do that job. And that if you really want to keep the people in that position, which you should, then you might have to change things. And this is a perfect time to start doing it. So thank you for coming on and joining us, Jason. Thank you for having me. All right. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you in about a month, but keep an eye on all of our social media and our landing pages and an eye out for our email if you're not getting it already. We'll have updates and more information coming as we go. And thank you.